Jeremiah chapter 31, I'm going to read first. And I want you to hold this scripture in your mind as to what God is saying over the atmosphere today. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with a loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you will be rebuilt. That was Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 3 and 4. There are so many of us that are literally shattered houses. We live in a world today where everything looks perfect. But if the truth be told, most people are covering the depths of of brokenness that cannot be described with words. And I'm not even trying to talk about the world because that's not what God sent me to do. I'm talking about in the church, we are filled with people that are broken, yet we cover up our brokenness with, with, uh, with, with, with things that look like filters from social media. People are hurting. People in the church are, are broken, they are hurting, but they have become experts at hiding it. The church is filled with people with great quotes, but little hope. We can speak a good word to get clicks, but we ourselves don't have no hope of what God can do in our lives. <laughs> We've become so used to pretense as a way of life. Skilled in hiding the aches of a broken spirit. This isn't my topic, but God said my daughters are hurting. So many of us in the body of Christ are losing hope at an alarming rate and it is of great concern to God. It is of great concern to God because God would have us do something phenomenal, great, undescribable, indescribable. He will have us to change the world. This season, I keep saying it to you guys and I'm not lying, is the season for the body of Christ. But the truth about it is that if we are broken and we are hopeless, we, we disqualify ourselves as being a vessel that God can use in this time. Hopelessness has a way of removing you from the plan that God has in this season. A hopeless vessel becomes a disqualified vessel. And so while we are okay with hopelessness, God says, it is not an option for you to remain in that state. Because what I would have do through you, you need to have hope. Because I need to have a vessel that is available, but is hope that births of availability. So tonight I have been sent by the Lord to preach a message titled, The Winds of Change. Turn your Bibles with me to Genesis. And I'm gonna read chapter 16. And I'm going to start from verse 1. Listen, I am going to tell you something, right? For all the theological folks, I'm struggling with the word Sarah and Abram. So I'm just going to call them Sarah and Abraham. <laughs> Amen. Now Sarah and Abraham's, now Sarah, Abraham's, Abraham's wife, had borne born him no children. And she had... 
an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, now, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. I don't know how you're going to have children by somebody else's. I mean, she said he does his wife. After Abraham had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan, so he went in to, to Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarah said to Abraham, my wrong be upon you. I gave you, I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that I had, as she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord, the Lord judged between you and me. So Abraham said to Sarah, indeed, is your maid. She's in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarah dealt, and, and when Sarah dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her in a spring of, of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so you shall not, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. Then she said to the Lord who spoke to me, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have also, I have also here seen him who sees me bless the reading of the lord's word so i know everybody here abraham and sarah's story and they think i'm going to preach about abraham or sarah no as i was reading that story god drew my attention to a person in the midst of that story hagar was a woman in the house of sarah and abraham abraham couldn't have no kids by sarah and so sarah came up with a brilliant idea I know I have a useless maid over there I can't have no child but I'm gonna give my useless maid over there to you and I will cause her to have children for me I mean human beings are wicked and then the Bible says here she becomes Abraham's wife. But let me get you to understand life through the world of Hagar. She's sitting there as a servant one moment and the next minute she is the wife of the man in command. She's sitting there and in a moment, she goes from having no voice and being useless to having a stake in the pie. Of course, her shoulders rose up. <laughs> she couldn't have prayed a prayer. When you talk about, and he will do exceedingly and abundantly, she was living in an exceedingly and abundantly because you can't pray that kind of testimony. We're sitting here and we're asking God to promote us. Now, this guy was going from a servant to a wife she was going from a servant to the madame of the house everything was perfect suddenly the rage of jealousy that gripped the heart of sarah the bible says in verse 6 started to deal with her so harshly that the house that was so perfectly built for her began to crumble before her the place that she had began to enjoy so much the bricks began to fall away one 
by one. Have you ever been in a situation where life deals with, with you so harshly that you want to run away? <laughs> this woman sat there and Sarah dealt with her so harshly that the only thing she knew to do was run. I know we get that feeling when life deals with us harshly. You can look cute all you want, but every single one of us, no matter how great we are in faith, life will deal with you at some point, a harsh card. The harshness of life, the harshness of life began to, to rip at Hagar so much so that she decided that the only option she had was to not run cute but to flee have you have you seen somebody flee from a scene it means that what is behind them is so dangerous that they don't have any time to pack nothing look at nothing be cute but run away from the situation that they find themselves in the harshness of life but everything was cute a minute ago everything was a testimony a minute ago but there is a situation that we find ourselves in from time to time it's called the harshness of life when it looks like there is something out to get you when you get over one thing, another thing comes up. The harshness of life. The harshness of life. It has a way at ripping away at your spirit. To make you appear in church but be broken in spirit. The harshness of life. The harshness of life will get somebody to be a high-flying city girl one minute. And a redundant middle-aged woman that don't know what she's doing with her life the harshness of life the harshness of life will get a 21 year old to get saved be so excited that God could change the world through her and then be 30 years old and be broken by the fact that she has labored so hard on her dreams but dreams don't be are not achieved so easily it's called the harshness of life it has a way at breaking your spirit where you have no hope so you start living but the truth is that you want to escape the reality because life is not panning out to be exactly what you thought it would be. And the church is filled with so many of us that have experienced the beating of life's harshness. And so now we are losing our hope. Even when we are reaping the consequences of our own dumb and stupid foolish mistakes. Nobody can deny that the weight that life can bring when it's dealing with you harshly can push so deep down within our spirit. It can be so, it can be so heavy on our soul that every time somebody sees us smiling they don't know how much work it took to push that smile through this is why we got to be careful that we don't break people so, i mean we, we people come into the church to find hope they are going and standing on their last foot and we say some dumb and foolish things just to break them up even the more because you don't know what it took to get them to even show up in church that sunday Because when life deals with you, a hey, harsh card, all you can do is flee from the reality of what you're facing. So whether it be posting a perfect picture of a so-called perfect marriage, when in reality you are tormented each night by the one that lays down to you, the church is filled with marriages that are broken. <laughs> But the church is filled with people posting about glorious marriages. So, because it is so hard, 
God showed me something. We can be so quick to judge them, but that post is an escape to flee from the reality of that which is breaking their spirit. Because if I don't post that my marriage is beautiful, every time I look at you posting how glorious your marriage is, is, is how great your marriage is, it eats away about my spirit. So I need to post something to appear like I've got my own stuff together. So I need to flee from the reality that is tormenting me every day. The harshness, the harshness of life. <sighs> but, <sighs> but, I got a smile, everybody, every time somebody asks me the dumb question as to when am I going to get married. The devil is a liar, I don't know who gave somebody a clock on when a woman should get married. The, the harshness of life when I have to listen to your foolishness ask me when am I going to get married like I had already asked myself when am I going to get married. And I look up in the church and I don't see no man worth my time. And yet another birthday is looming. But I don't see a relationship, let alone a proposal, let alone a marriage. And I've got to listen to your foolishness. Ask me when I'm going to get married. My spirit is breaking. My my spirit is breaking. And so we come up with foolish things and statements like, you know, what if God didn't create me to be married? Girl, quit lying. God created you to be married because every time you see somebody else's love story, your whole body's tingling. So don't come up with no motivational speeches to make you feel like you don't want what you really want. But the truth about it, the truth about it is that the reality is so painful that we have to find a way of escaping that which is tormenting our spirit. So I'm not here to diss nobody. I understand that when life deals with you, a harsh card, the only option you have is to flee. And Hagar fled from the presence of of that which was breaking her spirit. She ran as far as she could from the harsh dealing of life. We understand that we do it all the time. But one day, the Bible says here that she runs into, in verse 8, the presence of God. <laughs> hey. One day by accident, she weren't looking for him, he was looking for her. Just like some of you, your friends dragged you here tonight, you weren't looking for God to handle you tonight, but God said, no, 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 you've been escaping me for far too long, I am going to handle your life today. She ran. Have you ever been fleeing from something and you just want to escape everybody and go hide in wherever you can find and just be alone? But she wants to be alone and she finds the presence of God. She runs right into the presence of God. And God says to her right there, Hagar, you got to love God because she running thinking, how did this man know my name? But dumb question, he knows all things. Hagar, where are you coming from? And where are you going? You see, the truth is that whenever you really have an encounter with God, he will always make you unveil your history. Whenever you really have an encounter with God, he will always make you face where you're coming from. The thing that you're trying to hide from, he will make you face your history. We all want to be cute Christian ladies, so we want to hide where we are coming from. We want to hide the things that we have done. We want to hide the mistakes we have made, but you can't come to church to hide. 
If you want to hide, you got to find yourself in a club where you're cute dress. If you want to hide, you got to find yourself in the pub and where you're cute. You can't come to God and hide. She runs into the presence of God and he says, Hey God, what is your story? I, I, I know that you know what to do when you see an angel. Because I know who I am and I know how this goes. I'm an angel and when someone like you sees me, you fall on your knees and you bow and you worship. But you don't hear, you ain't never heard the scripture that says that they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. So I'm not interested in worship that comes from a source that's not real. I'm not interested in your how great is the Lord when I know what you're thinking is that how can this great God be tormenting my life? So, 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 let's skip the religious activities. And tell me what's pinching you. We have got to get to a place in prayer where we learn to be honest. We pray some dumb prayers that ain't going nowhere other than the ceiling. I have children and my children tell me how much they love me all the time. In fact, they sing me this song. They said, my mommy is the best, the best there. And when they sing it, girl, my whole body be going like this. Like <laughs> Sometimes even when they skip to the dad, I'm like, come back, come back. And it makes me feel so good. That's what praise will do to God. But they don't have my time to say how great I am when they're hungry when their knee is broken they don't got time to tell me how great I am because right now what is concerning them isn't how great of a mummy I am what is disturbing them is the fact that their knee is grazed what is disturbing them is the fact that they're hungry and that's why Jesus said you got to be like little children because they don't have no time to front they are ready to be real with their parents so I'm not interested in you coming to tell me how great I am when I know what is really pinching you but I'm waiting for you to get real so we're going to stand here with a, a Christian life that don't look or have no testimony until you are ready to get real with me. So you keep asking, how comes I don't have the experiences that everybody's having? It's because you ain't getting real with God. Because God's sitting there folding his hands saying, until you are ready to talk, until you're, let, you're ready to let me see your real self, until you're let me to, ready to let me see what is paining you, until you are ready to be real with me, I'm going to fold my hands and I'm going to wait. Because my question is, Hagar, where are you coming from? Jesus says, I'm, I'm. <laughs> Listen, God is about to get all of us together. <sighs> and so Hagar begins to open up her mouth and she lays it bare before the Lord. She begins to speak truthfully. And she says, I'm fleeing from that which has been distressing my life. I'm, I'm fleeing from that which has been causing me pain. So I, I, I get it now. Let me tell you, I am broken in spirit. I'm, I'm, I have been dealt so badly by Sarah because really and truthfully, I was minding my business and then she found me. And what she did was that she used me. And when she couldn't stand me no more, she began to deal harshly with me. I am breaking in my spirit because life is dealing with me harshly. And thank you for allowing me to tell you how I really feel because I didn't think that you cared. But I'm going to open up and tell you the truth that every time this is for somebody here, blood trickles down my leg every month to confirm to me or give me what seems to be a confirmation that I will never hold a 
baby that I so long for. My heart is broken. My heart is broken. My spirit is broken. When I see a girl, I come up in the in the church and says, this is her baby. The truth is that I've seen my period today and the doctor told me that I would never have to have a baby. So I want to rejoice with my sister, but my, my heart is broken because one month I believe that you could change my story. Now it's two months. Now it's three months. Three months has gone into four years and I still don't have a baby. My spirit is broken, God. I'm going to tell you the truth and let you know that I want to worship you, but my spirit is broken. My spirit is broken from the fact that I can't seem to get myself together. The church needs to start getting honest with ourselves. Yeah, I know that life is not working out the way you saw when you were a little, little girl. In fact, let me skip that. Life is not working out the way the pastor told you when you gave your life to Christ. And so she said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this. I'm telling you, you have got to find yourself in a position in prayer where you are honest with God. She rips up the veil. I can imagine it being so dramatic. I mean, imagine telling your life story to somebody and I hear her crying before the angel of the Lord and his response cracks me up the angel says not come here let me give you a hug some of you are looking for a pity party for so long but understand that your pity party don't change your story People telling you this, how sorry they feel for you, don't, don't do nothing for you. You don't need a pity party. You don't need no one to say sorry. You don't need no pastor to counsel you for three hours. Listen, the angel looks at her and he says, return. I know you want me to hold your hand and make you comfortable in the wilderness. I know you want me to tell you that she was wicked. I know that you want me to tell you everything that will make you feel good, but making you feel good won't change your story. People leave in churches so fast because pastors won't tell you my job ain't to make you feel good. My job is to change your life. And so we've got the church now filled with so many pastors sitting there motivating you. But now you're depressed because their motivation ain't changing nothing. Sometimes you got to be comfortable with your pastor being mean to you. You got to be comfortable with your leader saying some harsh truth to you. The angel says, I ain't got time to make you feel happy. Get back home. Face the thing that has been dealing with you harshly. Because running never solved no issue. Pretense never brought back nobody's joy. Let me tell you something real quick. There is a reason some people think that I am full of myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I don't have no time to be inspired by no relationship that is not built on the foundation of God's love. You can hashtag black love all your life. I don't have your time because you'll be posting about how great your husband is on Valentine's Day and divorcing by Easter. I don't have your time. You can black love all you want. Before I am black, I am a Christian. So until you build your foundation on the word of God, don't come and try and inspire me by your marriage that is filled with pretense. You see, the thing about the body of Christ right now is that we are so filled on celebrity culture 
your pastoring inspired you in marriage but grab your union will be inspiring you in marriage God fix your life before you get divorced because the truth about it I want you to tell me how you managed to stay married I've been married for 37 years because I ain't got time for you to be falling in love and out of love because I've been through too many things in my life to be going in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, so you can keep your hashtag black love. Because if I keep my eyes stayed fixed on your glossy marriage, the same spirit of pretense might fall upon me. But God didn't call me to pretend my way through life. He's called me to abundance. He called me to survival. Jesus has called you to abundance. So the devil is, he, he wants us to stay in a place where we are okay with survival. Where we think, I mean, I have heard Christians say something and this is the state we are in a church. That when we hear the good testimony of what God is doing in somebody's life, we think they're lying because we are so used to everybody faking it that when God is doing something great we think they made it up no God is able to do a great thing in our life in your life he's able to have a perfect marriage nothing missing nothing broken he's made he's able to make you abundant greatly in abundance and abundance and abundance and abundance I, I, I have an ability to be wealthy and not be a crook I know you think everybody must be lying, but God is good. And so where the enemy wants to make you believe that the most you can have is survive, you, got, you have to reject him because the reason he wants to keep you in that state is because he knows that what God wants to do through you <laughs> listen, listen. God didn't just send her back home. This is what he did. He sent her back. And the Bible says that he blessed her and said to her, because what God is trying to do in your life is an ordinary. She was sitting there and asking God, God, just relieve me from my distress. And God said, I ain't trying to relieve you just from your distress. I'm not even just trying to bless you and give you a husband. I'm not just trying to bless you and give you a wife. I'm not just trying to bless you and give you children. I'm not just trying to bless you and give you a job. I'm not just trying to do an ordinary thing in your life I'm trying to give you a, a legacy that your children will feed from that your grandchildren will feed from so while you're sitting here and you're waiting for survival and you're waiting just to be okay I'm telling you I want to do something in you that when you have left this earth people will still be reaping the fruit of your existence I'm trying to give you a legacy yeah 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 so hey God I love what Bosse said. She said, I would love to tell you that was, that was where the story ended, that she returned home. She received this word from the Lord and everything was A-okay. Hallelujah. How many of you would love to just kind of hear a word from the Lord and woof? But Hagar's story tells you, she gets back into the house. God gives her an instruction. Some of you, you need a word from the Lord. Let me stop there a minute. The Bible says to her, go back. And the key to your peace for this season is to submit to your mistress. Some of you need to quit looking for your buster to be fired and hear a word from the Lord that tells you to show up on time. The job starts at nine o'clock. You get there at 8.30 on your desk. You need a word from the Lord. You need an instruction from the Lord because it is a divine instruction that will silence your troublemakers. I love it. I said, God wrote an entire message and broke it up into three different parts. Dr. Freeman said, he said, God didn't fix her marriage. He gave her an instruction. When something is troubling you, God sent her back, but he didn't send her back without an instruction. 
how, how, how Mimi, do I get an instruction? You pray. You are in some kind of a mess. You need to ask God for help. He said, well, Mimi, I've been praying. I need nothing changed. No, if you are in distress, you don't ask once or walk away. When you are really in distress, you bang, you scream, you cry, you shout, you keep hitting until the help that you need comes forth. The thing about it is that most of us have found a way to become comfortable with the distress that we are living in. We, we, have, we have began to prop ourselves up and self-medicate our pain. Right? And so we are now okay with living that way forever. We now want to make excuses for God as to why things haven't happened in our lives. But God says, I can still do the things that I said I would do. Listen, I ain't a man that I would lie. If I said I would do something, I would do it. If I gave you a promise, I am able to fulfill it. Don't try and come up with no foolishness and tell nobody that's the reason why you ain't had the breakthrough in your life. All you need is to go to God and seek his instruction. And stay there until your help comes forth. And so Hagar goes back home and in chapter 21, listen, years have gone by. In chapter 16, she was just pregnant. In 21, she has a grown child. And the Bible says that Sarah at this point was done with her. As in, I'm not dealing with you harshly for you to run. I want you to pack your bag, get out of my house. Abraham, take your side piece and send her somewhere. You don't want her in this house no more. And so look at the world from Hagar's point of view. She had no business in their mess. She found herself in a situation that she had no, she she didn't do nothing. But let me tell you something. The devil don't need it to be your fault. There were some of you sitting there asking this question, God, why me? They don't, don't ask God, why me? The devil don't need no reason to rock up on your house and want to fight you and rip the life out of you. So when the devil shows up at your door, you got to roll up your sleeve and get into the ring and fight for your life. He don't need no reason. So Hagar's here paying the consequences of Abraham's um, errors. Minding her business, but now she's paying the consequence of Abraham's disobedience. She wasn't the one that didn't trust God. You brought me into this mess. How many of you are sitting here in a situation in life where you are paying the consequences where you have sacrificed your life to somebody? We're sitting here and you have served someone, maybe your pastor, maybe your family member. And when they have done and they've had enough with you, they say, all right, time to go. And you are now in debt. You are now struggling. You are now depressed because of the evil that was in somebody else's heart. This is where Hagar finds herself again. And the Bible says in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 21, that she gets to the wilderness and she starts wandering aimlessly. She gets to the wilderness and she wanders aimlessly. I I know that we know how it feels like to be wandering life aimlessly, to be living but not growing. See, we read the Bible sometimes and we think it's far off. But she's sitting there and she's living, but she's going around in circles. She's living, but she's going around in circles. She's living and she's not growing. You have this lady who has a promise of God over her life, but she's now in the desert walking 
aimlessly. Some of you have a promise of God over your life. The Lord said that your voice will go around the globe, but you're sitting down and you're walking life aimlessly. You, you heard a voice from the Lord that said that in, in, you will be one of the greatest people in this nation. You heard that voice from the Lord. You heard the voice from the Lord that said you will be so financially free that you would liber liberate your family from poverty. You have a promise of God over your life, but yet you find yourself every Monday at the same job, on the same desk, doing nothing but not growing, wandering aimlessly. <sighs> but you can't respond to the world in a season like Hagar. You gotta respond to the world in a season like a man called David. <sighs> who had a promise of God over his life, but got sent back to his day job, wilderness season. You have a promise of God over your life, but, but where you are right now is frustrating because you are not manifesting what you know you heard God say to you. So you are now in the wilderness season, but David said, though I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil because I am walking through the wilderness. I'm not making my resting place. And he got made her resting place, the wilderness. But listen, this is what David said. He said, I will fear no evil. I I don't fear the wilderness because of the simple fact that I'm going through it. Why? Because I know I've got a promise of God over my life. I might be sitting here living in a council flat, dead broke, but I know this isn't my state because I've been anointed to be king. I'm here with the sheep but I've been anointed to be king. There is a promise of God of my life. I have been anointed to be king. I might be sitting here right now and I know that I don't look like what I'm supposed to be or what I'm telling you that God is going to make of my life. But I know that I have been anointed to be king. That even when David went from the bushes to the palace... He said, I, I, I have been anointed to be king. I, I'm in a council flat, but I'm royalty. Uh, I'm, I'm dead broke. And I don't have no money in my purse right now. But God has a promise over my life. I'm not talking about no hashtag queen with no revelation. Who be getting themselves in stupid debt so that they can wear Louis Vuittons and Gucci so that you can think that they've got their money and their coins together? I'm not talking about no hashtag queen with no revelation who be living in a council flat and driving a Range Rover. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about no foolishness like that. What I'm talking about. I'm talking about I'm talking about real queens who says my nine to five don't correlate with the vision of God over my life but don't watch that because I have been anointed to be king listen you might see me right now and all you see is the bushes but I'm telling you something you don't have to see it but I'm telling you what God has spoken over my life my life and my dreams don't match what you see but I have been anointed to be king who am I talking to right now you're sitting here you're frustrated but you gotta hold yourself up like David did and said regardless of what you see of me right now I have been anointed <laughs> some people this is what we do we make the process of the wilderness our home David got an upgrade. He went from the bush to the palace. <laughs> Some of you have got an upgrade. You've gone from dire poverty to a promotion. You've gone from dire poverty. No, no, hold on. Don't scream amen for the thing that's not yours. <sighs> he, went from, he went from dire poverty to getting a job. But he said... <sighs> God didn't just promise me the palace. You can't just be comfortable with the process of your journey. God didn't promise me the palace. He gave me the crown. 
I'm speaking to somebody right now. There is a, there is a vision that God has put in your life. But you've got a good job. Your children in private schools. And now you're comfortable with the palace. But you don't have the crown. And God sent me here to, to tell you today. You have to remember that I didn't give you the palace. I placed on you a crown. So you've got to remember. Never, never lose sight of the promise of God over your life regardless of where you get to. I know it might be that you have been in the situation for one year, for two years. But God said to Abraham, I will give you descendants. I will give you descendants. I didn't say I will give you a child. I said I will give you descendants. I will give you descendants that they weren't able to count just the same way they ain't able to count the stars. I will give you descendants and you're sitting there one year and you don't even see one son. Are you frustrated because you think that God is a man that he lies but that ain't the truth. God when he says something he's able to bring it to pass regardless whether you've been waiting one year, two years or 25 years. If he said it, my God has a way of bringing it to pass. Come on, who am I speaking to? God said, I didn't just promise you the palace. I placed on you the crown. The enemy wants you to get comfortable with the wilderness. He wants you to make your rest place the wilderness. He wants you to stay there so long until you forget the promise, until you begin to make it your home, until you begin to say to yourself, the wilderness is where I'm going to die. Some of you have been in the same job for so long that you have shelved your dreams. God help me. I promised my team I would not take off my shoes today. That's the only way. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it is, it is, it is. It is, it is, it is. You ready? You ready? <sighs> Listen, I want to say something over your life right now. This is my goal. But I ain't going to be afraid to prophesy over your life right now. The same way you weren't afraid to jump out and claim the promises of your life, God will jump out at you and he will cause the promises that he has prophesied to you in your quiet place, in your secret place. And I, your friend, will see it. I will be around you to see it. God will deliver the things that he has promised you. The wildness in your spirit, the wildness in your spirit, the wildness in your spirit, that lioness will arise and it will shatter the kingdom of darkness in the name of Jesus. Listen, 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 listen. The enemy will have you believe that the wilderness is where you are going to die. He will have you believe that because you have been there long enough, that's going to be your end. He will have you believe that because you have been looking to God for the fruit of the womb for 10 years, that you are never going to hold your baby. He will have you believe that because your husband has been battering you for so many years, you are never going to have a man that will love you. But that same man will turn around and he will be a prince. And together, you will be an example in the body of Christ. In the name of Jesus, the enemy wants to get you to believe that the wilderness season is where you are going to die but you have got to rise up like David and say listen God didn't promise me just the palace he gave me the crown my, my, my child might have been lost in the world for so long that it looks like there's no way of rescuing them I'm telling you I'm telling you I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you that child ain't gonna remain lost forever. Because while everybody was wrapping up Sarah's story, while everybody, or Hagar's story, while everybody was wrapping up Hagar's story, while everybody was rejoicing over her life, while Hagar had given up hope herself, some of you walked in here today and you don't have no hope inside of you because you don't think God can do something great in your life no more. You have been waiting on him all these years but suddenly come 
come on, come on, come on, come on. You cannot count a believer out that has breath in them because they serve a God of the suddenly. I don't care how long you've been in that situation. I don't care how bad that situation has been. But I've been sent by the Lord to hold you in the rain just a little longer. To keep you up just a little longer. Because the God of a sudden change is about to blow in your direction. Suddenly. Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly. The Bible says in verse 17 that suddenly God shows up. Suddenly, God shows up. He shows up in the life of that person who said that there was gonna be no change. You know, see, sometimes God don't even need you to have a hope because He's got you, and so He will come in and snatch you when the enemy wants to steal you. And so you have been walking around with no hope, but He snatched you in here today some of you walked in here like it was just another conference but God said you are walking into your season of change the winds of change are blowing the winds of change are blowing the winds of change are blowing over somebody's life I see the change moving all over you the winds of change are blowing the winds of change are blowing the winds of change are blowing they said you will never hold your baby but the season of barrenness is finally over they said you will never be in a glorious marriage but you are about to become a testimony of what a godly marriage look like that man is about to become the image of Jesus Christ you gave up hope in your marriage but I'm telling you the winds of change are blowing you gave up you gave up hope on your vision you thought that God was never gonna show up no more on your behalf but the winds of change are blowing because after you have suffered for a while after you have suffered for a while the winds of change are blowing after you have suffered for a while because let me tell you something that never don't want you to know we may endure for a night I see your change. 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 Who am I talking to today? I see your change. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And God shows up in verse 17 and he says this. He said, I have heard the voice of your distress. Come on now. You thought you were just screaming in this building, but you were screaming from the depths of the thing that had been pinching you. And you were screaming out in faith unto the Lord. And God shows up and he said, I heard the voice of your distress. I see your change. Come on, come on, come on. She walked into her season of change. And she remembers her experience with God in chapter 16. Where she opened her mouth and says, I know God that you see me. The devil want to make you isolated in your issues to make you think that nobody sees what you're going through. But where your pastor never saw you, where your sister never saw you, the Bible says God sees you. But what is even more great about the great God that we serve is that when he sees you, he causes change to occur. So listen, let me tell you something now. God sent me here today to tell you that I see. I see you. I see. I see you and I have 
the power to change your circumstance. And I am a good father and what I am going to cause to happen is I'm going to blow the wind of change over your life. Oh, I'm celebrating God right now because I see somebody's change is coming. I'm celebrating God right now because I see somebody's miracle manifesting. And God said, God said to, to, Abra, to, to Hagar, he said, I'm about to manifest the promise I gave you in chapter 16. Who am I speaking to tonight? There is a promise that God gave you many years ago. But God says, I'm about to manifest because your season has arrived. The winds of change has blown over you. Your season is finally changing. So right now, all those promises that you thought I was joking, I'm about to manifest them in your life. Who am I speaking to? Your season of change. It's finally here. Come on. Somebody give God a praise. Before I go on, before I go on, and what we're going to be doing here tonight is that we're going to be praying. In this prophetic atmosphere, we're going to be praying for you. The ministers are going to come up and they're going to join me and they're going to pray with anybody that needs prayer just to keep you held in the ring just a little longer because I don't need you to quit just before your breakthrough comes. Because the Bible, because the, the, we, we know something about life is that it is dark, darkest before dawn. So God has sent you in this atmosphere so that you can be held up for as long as you need until the manifestation of the promise comes to life. So we're going to be praying for you, but before we pray for you, whew, I see a change is on the way. My God, my God. The song says, I feel a change. But God says, I want you to say, I see a change. Because ain't nobody care about what you feel. But what I care about is what you see. Oh, all right, all right. I see a change. It's on the way. Ooh. Because weeping may endure for a night, but surely joy comes in the morning. Somebody's morning season is about to arrive. Weeping may endure for a night, but surely joy comes in the morning. Your season of suffering is over. Your season of frustration is over. Your season of pain is over. You are about to walk into the season of rejoicing. Because hear what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 31. I will rebuild you. Hear what she said, she said, she said, he said, I will rebuild you, but the scripture didn't end there, and you shall be built, because if he spoke it, it will come to pass, but I don't want you to miss this opportunity, I keep telling you, I ain't no motivational speaker, because Jesus, listen, someone can give you the 10 steps to getting whole, lies, because when the devil snatch your weave ain't no motivational speech that will take you out of that situation but Jesus heals Jesus saves Jesus heals the broken hearted I want to give you an opportunity if you don't know Jesus in this atmosphere God couldn't have brought you here for you to walk back the same but I want to give it anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior an opportunity to say God I want to receive you today I want to come into the kingdom of the son of your of your love I want to be taken from darkness into life because you see when the devil knocks at the door of a believer they win when the devil knocks at the door of somebody that's his child trust me child ain't nobody gonna help you the only refuge is the blood of Jesus Christ and the Bible says how can we survive if we reject so great a salvation so if you don't have Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, I'm going to give you a moment just right where you are. I'm not even going to ask you to come up here. I just right where you are. The Bible says all you need to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth from right where you are. And 
and from that moment there is a spiritual transfusion that takes you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son and if you say to me Mimi do you know what I used to know Jesus I used to walk with the Lord but life dealt with me so harshly that I walked away from God I want to return today just show up your hands right there you are where you are thank you thank you very much right where you are just lift up your hands come on while we all celebrate the Lord just lift up your hands and I want to say this prayer of faith with you thank you I see you but God sees you I see you but God sees you I see you but God sees you <sighs> Heavenly Father Lord I want you to repeat this prayer after me Heavenly Father I come to you today just those who are saying the salvation I come to you today as my Lord and personal Savior I believe that you died on the cross for me and today I have run away from so many things but today I'm running to you I accept you as my Lord and Savior and today I believe that I have been saved thank you for saving me in Jesus name come on somebody give Jesus praise that is the biggest change that could ever take place